This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is an independent England football supporters podcast. Wednesday the 16th, 11am, it was time for the big one. The country comes to a standstill for 90 minutes, as it does on the odd occasion throughout the years. Now, Spain had already secured their place in the final in a dramatic game against Sweden the day before. But the venue this time for Australia against England was the Sydney Olympic Stadium, a fantastic venue, one full of recent history, one I've been to, uh, albeit slightly different now. 75,000 spectators squeezed in, predominantly strong and loud Australian voices, which is unsurprising, really. Uh, It was always going to be tough for the Lionesses in that respect, but they'd already experienced similar against Colombia. But you already know the score, don't you? England are through to the World Cup finals for the first time after beating Australia 3-1. Reasons to celebrate are plenty. Uh, I'm pleased to say I'm once again joined by the Evening Standards at Dom Smith to have a chat about it. Hello, Dom. Hello there. How are we doing? I'm very well, thank you. How's about that then? Into the final of the World Cup. For the first time since 66, it's been a long time coming, I think, for our proud football nation. But here we are again. Here we are. It's uh, Well, do you know what? I Someone brought this up earlier. And where do you sort of draw the line of being in a World Cup final? Do you actually cater for the men's team in 66? Is that right to mention that? Or should we also mention 2017 when the under 20s and the under 17s made it to a world cup final or is it just the women are in the in the world cup finals that it's their own world cup finals I'm, I'm kind of torn really as to what way to look at it well for the women's side it's a first ever so it's yeah. a historic moment um for the senior team it's the second time ever obviously the, the men got there in 66 but this is the second time either of the senior teams have got there but but yeah of course youth teams have been there as well including the 20 17 the under 20s got there uh, and of course the under 17s got there as well in the same year so yeah I suppose it doesn't really matter which way you look at it the point is it's a historic moment that doesn't come around very often and it's um to, you know, to do it at senior football I think you'd say means more because uh youth football is preparing for these days where yes. it really is the real thing sort of thing yeah. so um it, we should we should bask in the glory of it a little bit more although I say that there is more glory to get, isn't there? Because there is still one game that stands between England and and a historic trophy. Very much so. We'll uh, we shall come to that in a moment. But let's just look back on this uh, this famous result against Australia. Serena Weigman, the lineup she decided to stick with the lineup that took on Colombia and saw them off the three four one two: Mary Earps, Jess Carter, Millie Bright, Alex Greenwood, Lucy Bronze, Georgia Stanway, Kira Walsh. Uh, Rachel Daly, Ella Toon, Lauren Hemp, and Alessia Russo. It's a strong lineup um, that we've got at the moment, and one that's sort of adapted and evolved as the tournament has uh, has gone on. One that's evolved since last year as well, hasn't it? For various reasons. Yeah, it doesn't feel like um, it's been that long, really, since the European Championships. Yeah. Which- yeah, the team has changed so much. I, I don't feel like the squad has changed hugely, but it feels like the team that, that that goes out there and is expected to deliver as the first eleven has changed quite a lot, as well as players stepping up who were were coming off the bench at the European Championships. We obviously know about Toon and and Russo who couldn't get starts a year ago, but they, that they're starting now. As well as that, there have also been players who've who've stepped up, who who had even less game time at the European Championships. I feel like it's it's good to see Jess Carter having an excellent tournament. And yes. I feel like Alex Greenwood is the obvious shout. It, it, it feels to me like Alex Greenwood has been 
you know, uh, you know, she she she's she strikes a ball so cleanly with her with her left foot. She's been one of the, the best players um, in English football from an England perspective for for maybe eight, nine, ten years. But it feels like finally she's getting her flowers on uh, on a world stage. You know, it, it, I think she she's she's a player deserving of of being a starting t- uh, eleven member, and she's finally getting that. And I, for me, if the tournament stopped tomorrow she'd be the player of the tournament for me Alex Greenwood um not for England for the for the entire tournament so um I'm pleased for players like that who who, who are getting their chance when maybe they had fewer of them last summer yeah undoubtedly there will be a FIFA team of the tournament come the end of it we'll have to wait and see um if uh, Alex Greenwood gets into that but yeah I can totally see um how she, how she would and the way she slotted into that back three um that Serena Weigman has has bought in as the competition has gone on. Uh, but it wasn't just our, our starting eleven that we were talking about. Australia, they decided to bring Sam Kerr in for her first start of the tournament. Uh, that was the big talking point. She missed the first two games, I believe it was, and then they sort of just introduced her um, as the competition's gone on. And she was clearly the the danger player for Australia and she came under some some early challenges um as England kind of put a marker on her as the uh, the game began didn't they yeah absolutely I I think it's fair to say that Australia despite having a a large number of real top class players they probably only have one player who's really without a shadow of a doubt a world-class player and that feels like Sam Kerr and for her to to play as well as she did, she caused England real problems. And I know she missed a few opportunities when when Australia were trailing 2-1 in this match. And of course, they ended up losing 3-1. But her goal was excellent, even though it took a slight nick off Millie Bright. I think it it, it was probably heading in anyway. And and she just showed what she's like, what she's capable of. And she also showed that Australia it's credit to them. I know they're at home, but but it's credit to them that they're even in these semi-finals. You know, I, th- I think if she'd been fit for the whole tournament, they'd have got there probably even more easily than they did. So she she did cause England problems and looked look to reach a World Cup final is incredible. To but but to to reach a World Cup final and to have knocked out a player of that caliber is um is real credit to Serena Wiegmann's team. Yeah, the opening sort of encounters of the game were it was slightly. Cagey, I thought to to start with, but it, it began to sort of get into gear. Georgia Stanway had an effort. Um, Mackenzie Arnold saved one as well, but it was thirty five minutes when that first goal went in. Ella Toon from an angle smashed it home. Fantastic goal for uh, for Ella Toon, who was in for Lauren James, of course, who was um, still unselectable due to her uh, second match ban. I feel like with Ella Toon, it's been a difficult few months, really. It's been quite hard as someone who wants England to do well to to watch Ella Toon in an England shirt, probably since the turn of the year. Um, I feel like she's been a player who's been lacking confidence. It's been quite obvious in the way she plays. She's, She's been dispossessed a bit too easily, bundled off the ball a bit too easily. And quite often when she has the ball, she's not been taking these fearless shots or fearless uh decisions where you move forward with the ball she's often passed backwards and and that that speaks to a player who who's not not in her highest ebb really but she needed a moment like this and what a moment it was she struck that ball so cleanly it swung outwards into the top corner it was something that i think any goalkeeper in the world could have faced and wouldn't have saved that that effort it was it was a peerless strike and it's exactly what you need, not just if you're England hoping to make a final, but if you're Ella Toon looking for confidence and looking for a reason for the manager to keep persisting with you, especially when the player who who could come into your role next for the next match is is Lauren James, who many people think is is you know fast becoming one of the best players in the world and had had shone at this World Cup so far. So for Ella Toon, a great moment for England, a great moment. It was. Um, yeah, it, it was a brilliant goal to watch, really. Yeah, we'll we'll touch on Lauren James in a moment, but I know that every every top flight stadium these days has camera in every conceivable position. 
But there was uh, an angle of just behind Ella Toon where she struck that ball. And as you say, you can see it arcing just round um, Mackenzie Arnold to go into the goal. It's, it's a really fantastic angle of a, of a really fantastic goal. Uh, so England went in at the break by up a goal to nil. Uh, second half, you'd expect Australia to pile on the, uh, the pressure a bit more. There, there came a point in the game where I, I thought that every cross that Australia tried um, was either being headed away either by by that back three of Bright, Greenwood or Carter. And I, there came a point where I was thinking, do you know what, I'm, I'm not sure if Australia are going to get the opportunity from the cross um, in that manner that they were trying to do. And then it came on the hour. You've already mentioned Sam Kerr there where uh, she scored that goal and she picks it up on the halfway line, runs, I, I don't know how fast she must have run, but it's she struck the ball with about 25 yards out from goal. I'm, I'm almost going to say that's goal of the tournament from what I've seen so far. It, it really was a cracking goal, but at the same time, it wasn't unsurprising of, of what we know Sam Kerr can do. Well, Millie Bright dropped off really, didn't she? She gave her the space and Usually, if you get tight to a player, they can run round you. It was probably the right, amazingly, it was probably the right decision that Millie Bright gave her space because if she'd gone, if she'd gone and moved in for the player, she Sam Kerr probably would have gone round her. So, mm. I think the defender probably did all she could have done, really, and yet still, it's ended up in the back of the net from what felt to me like about twenty five yards, maybe more. Really, brilliant goal. Um, it got Australia back level out of nothing, really. I feel like all three of the goals, um, uh, all four of the goals, I should say, sorry, in this match felt like they came from nothing. You know, I know we'll get onto the last two in a minute, but if you if you can cast your mind back about, you know, across all four goals, it doesn't feel like any of them were came from patient build up. They they all came from 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 long passes or, or, or freak moments. But yeah, there yeah. was there was. No- Nothing unplanned about this goal. It was a it was a well sized up shot and it flew past Mary Earps. Yeah, see, I could call about being sort of out of nothing goals. I understand what you mean there, and I'm thinking that Millie Bright she's kind of caught in six of one and half a dozen of the other of as to what she does. Um, yeah, and yeah. at the same time, they both play for Chelsea, so they're both going to be aware of each other and and what they're capable of of doing as well. Um, so it's all those little mind games that are probably going on between them. Absolutely. But in the end, you know, Sam Kerr comes out on top. And in that moment, Australia raised their level a bit and you start to think, oh, you know, you, for a moment, you start to fear for England, really, because the, Australia have got the home crowd behind them and uh, they could they could kind of chug on from there. But it didn't happen, did it? England, England regrouped. No, that's right. I mean, the momentum you would have thought should have really swung in in their favour, but it it didn't really go that way because come seventy minutes, Millie Bright puts a a, a long sweet ball through to Lauren Hemp, and she's sort of going between two defenders to slot home. Um, it, again, it kind of came out of nothing because I, I was watching it, thinking, "Well, the defender's going to clear that surely," but Lauren Hemp has just managed to ease her way through and and find that space. Yeah, we have to be careful here to to credit Lauren Hemp, but not to give her too much credit just because of hindsight. I think she did all she could have done, really. She she pressured those two defenders. She she caused them something. She gave them something to think about. She caused them problems. But it's not like she necessarily deserved for the ball to f- fall to her. You know, how that defender kind of gave up the ball. I know she didn't deliberately give up the no. ball, but how she got so disorientated and, and allowed Lauren Hemp to squeeze between her and her teammate and, uh, and steal the ball. Hemp couldn't have done any more, really, because if she had done, she'd have been penalised for pushing one of the one of those defenders in the back. But it was still it still felt quite fortuitous that it came to her. But she tucked it away well, and England were ahead. And, and again, you you watch the celebrations of her teammates, Lauren Hemp, and and they you could tell they thought that it was another goal out of nothing. Really, it, it was sort of like a pumped ball out over the top, which should have been easily dealt with, never was, and suddenly the ho- the co hosts are losing again. It was crazy, really. Yeah, right place, right time for Lauren Hemp there, who I thought had a fabulous second half. Um, I agree. Yeah, re- really good 
performance for her. I mean, you could pick out so many of the the Lionesses players, um, but yeah, Lauren Hemp has, has had a good one, uh, and she was involved in the the third goal where she provides the pass for Alessia Russo, who's on the right, and I'm I'm visualising the Columbia goal at the same time. She's she scored from the same acute angle, hasn't she, to make it three one. Yeah, and and you know what? When you get to a World Cup or a European Championships, a major tournament, you're probably not going to have if you're if you're a starting striker for a team, even if you're a starting striker from a major nation, which Alessia Russo is, being an England player, the chances you get are not going to be too many, and the chances you get are probably not going to be the chances you'd get in training. They're, they're not going to be opportunities that you'd pick. You know, you're, you're going to get these opportunities at the from from the side of the box, from angles. She's taken them effectively. In the last couple of games, she really has taken her opportunities, and that is what you need from a striker. She 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 took one touch to to, to stop the the ball, and then she fired it into the bottom corner, just like she did against Colombia. And mm-hmm. and that's exactly what England need is clinical finishing. They'll need it again in the final, but they they certainly showed it here. And and Australia didn't really, did they? Because they they had a few opportunities before. Russo's goal to, to to level, particularly from that corner when Sam Kerr hashed it wide and they never took it and and now they're out. So in England are the team, I feel, who who've shown the more clinical finishing and they're in the final because of that. Absolutely. Three goals now for Alessia Russo in the mm-hmm. tournament. And I believe the the top goal scorer at the moment is on five. So she's got a chance for the for the golden boot for the tournament, but she'll obviously have to score two or more. Um, in the final against Spain. Uh, We'll talk Spain in a moment, but there is a conundrum now um, for Serena Weigman. These last two games against Colombia and Australia, she selected the same starting eleven. Does she change a winning team? Is there going to be a clamour for people uh, asking for or pleading for Lauren James to come back um, to the starting eleven? Because, of course, she's scored three goals already so far. Well, I think that clamour is going to happen, isn't it? Because Lauren James, you know, you don't you don't want to be disparaging, but she does make it look a bit easy sometimes. I know that she picked the wrong options um, um, when she's playing occasionally, and 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 quite often she'll she'll shoot from a place where she shouldn't shoot from, or she'll pass from a place where she should shoot from. But you know, when when she's on it, she she does feel like an un, unstoppable player. And at moments in the group stage, that 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 goal she scored against Denmark to beat them, the the double she scored against China and it should have been a hat-trick because she wrongly had one disallowed. In those moments for England, she was making this 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 World Cup look very easy indeed. So showed her na- naivety against Nigeria, really. I think we we all accept that. And that was in a match where she wasn't really showing anything like the the impact that we know she can have. So look, there there is going to be a clamour for her to come back. Partly because we know that she could come back. You know, everyone turned their attentions to how long that ban would be as soon as she did that foul. It sort of became the, the, the most talked about football-related topic yeah. on on social media for a good day or so. Uh, and so, with people now knowing that it was a two-day, a two-game ban, that's almost a reason why people will expect her to come back. But you know, Ella Toon has has put in an excellent display there. She, she played well against. Colombia at moments and, and excellently against Australia and she's really put in a she, she's going to be causing a bit of a headache for, for Serena Viedman but do you know what it's great to have the, those options uh, Lauren James off the bench as an England player has shown that she can be a good impact sub and Ella Toon has as well as we all famously know from last summer so whoever does start and I think only one of them will I think only one of them can whoever yeah. does start we know that they can be replaced by another very impactful player. And, and that bodes so well for England. My personal thoughts is use one as the impact sub and and I would stick with the, the starting 11 and, and bring Lauren James on. Has and when you need to come the uh, the final against Spain is, is my own personal thoughts on that. Obviously, Serena's in charge of that and won't be listening to me. Um, but Spain are the opposition. What a journey for those guys. Uh, they came through, not not just in this tournament, but f- if we cast our minds back um, through the past, what is it, 15 to 18 months. Uh, but just to, to remind ourselves, Spain came through to the final after a dramatic game against Sweden, where they took the lead 
on around 81 minutes. Sweden equalised on 87 and then Spain stole it in the last minute um, to make their way through to the final. But for for those that perhaps aren't aware, as I mentioned, these last 16, 18 months have been quite hard um, for the for the Spanish women's team. I'm not fully versed in it all, um, but basically some of the players voiced their concerns over the manager, Jorge Vilda, um, and about, I think, his training practices, his coaching, perhaps lack of player welfare. And this all goes yeah, back to... And t- his, his general, con- just his general conduct as well. Yes, around. yeah. I, I was trying to be sort of, sort of nice, but yeah, there, there are sort of that side of it as well. But this all goes back to the Euros. Um, and it meant that there was a certain amount of his players who effectively sort of went on strike and announced they wouldn't play under him. So he's had to bring together almost a, a semi-new team. So it's, it's quite a credit to Spain and to him that they've made it to the final. Yes, it's, it's not been an easy year in Spanish football. Um, and, and of course, overlapping this has been the fact that Spanish football, in, in the on the women's side at least, has, has really boomed over this period. So you, you, you've had this kind of... Um, this inability to kick on for, for for very fair reasons, overlapping the fact that this, the the women's game is absolutely booming in Spain, and and I think it would would be growing and the national team improving at a faster rate if this weren't happening. But the fact of the matter is, it is happening, and so it is to their credit that they've that they've um, that they've managed to to field a, a competitive team and get to the final, their first major final uh, as a national team. I've been very impressed with them. Um, you know, I'm sure at some point you're going to ask me who I think the favourite is. I, I think it's England only because of their know-how having won it last last summer, the European Championships, and having knocked out Spain. But I don't think it's going to be... I don't think England are favourites for any reasons besides that. I think Spain have been excellent. I know they lost 4-0 to Japan at the mm. end of the group stage, and, and that was a performance that we, we've seen from the Spain women and men over the years, really, where Spain dominate possession and sometimes they do they do get sloppy, giving chances away on the counter-attack. And 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 on a day when you you lose the ball a few too many times, sometimes your opponents will just stick it in the back of the net a few times and you've lost the match and you're you're, you're scratching your head as to how it's happened. Um but that that's what happened against Japan, who were absolutely ruthless in that match and and, and won four nil. That will give England confidence. And I actually do think that England will want to play on the counter-attack. I don't think Serena Viegman will will tell Georgia Stanway and Kira Walsh, who obviously Kira Walsh knows a lot of these Spain players very well. I don't think Serena Viegman is going to be telling these this England team, let, let, let's go toe to toe with Spain and play them at their own game, and let's let's dominate possession. I, I don't think that's how you win this final. I think you accept that you're playing against footballers who can keep the ball better than you, but you you accept that, that you, you feel that actually you're you're a better team. You, you're you're more capable of getting the big moments right, and I think England will go in as favourites. But Spain have been excellent in this tournament. I I was asked to come up with six. Um, players that I was, you know, six players to look out for before the tournament, and I was insistent. I think I've said this already. I was insistent not to put Pateas in there. I yes, think that Aitana yeah. Bon Mati is a is a better player in midfield, I, I think, and she's been outstanding in this mm. tournament. Mati. Um, but also the, the young 19 year old left winger Salma Parayuelo has been absolutely superb, and and Lucy Bronze spoke about that um, the, the the impact she's had. She's a, she's a, a Barcelona teammate of Bronze's. Lucy Bronze was speaking about her just straight after beating Australia um, uh, on Wednesday. She was saying that's that, that's a player who's who's very impactful and, and and could have a say on the final, but. I think England will go in as favourites, not as strong favourites, but as favourites because they've 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 proven that they can get over the line. I think you're right. We, we will go in as favourites marginally, and I think it is because of that sort of winning habit. And we know how to win, having won the Euros last year. We know what is needed to be done uh, throughout the ninety minutes, how to to manage the game. Even, even thinking back now to to that game against Germany, just managing it in the the last 
what was it, six, seven minutes when we were taking it into the corners and you're thinking, oh, do we need yeah. to do that so, so soon or so now? Uh, but they managed it superbly. So they've got that, that sort of mentality. They know what is needed um, to win. Of course, as you mentioned, we did play Spain. Um, that was the last time we met in the quarterfinals down in Brighton, wasn't it, where they took us to extra time. Uh, I think it was Ella Toon who scored that day as well. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, That's correct. Yep. Yeah. Um, but in the past, we've met 16 times, uh, eight wins in our favour. We've only lost twice and we've drawn the other six. Not that that means a great deal, uh, but it's it's going to be a really entertaining game. It is, the final is, is going to be on Sunday. I think it's a 10 a.m. kickoff here in England. One thing I did want to say, though, uh, I'm not even sure if this is the right time to even say it. Um, do we need to spare a thought for for Leah Williamson, Beth Mead, Frank Kirby? Um, I, I was thinking this earlier after the match. Such is the the strength and depth of this team or the squad. It's it's so good and so deep. Do they even get back in? Come come fitness and come like the the Nations League when that starts up again. The Lionesses next games. Uh, yeah, I, th- I, th- I think they do. I think they do. I think there's a place in the England squad for for Frank Kirby. I think there's certainly a place in the England starting eleven for for Beth Mead, who I would say is is a, a, probably a step above world class. I'd say she's one of the be- one of the very few best players in the world. Is Mead uh, and and Leah Williamson is England's captain um, and a great leader. Um, more by more by example than anything else. Um, more by example than by by saying anything in particular. So I think these are players who do get back in. I, I understand the question, but I think, to be honest, England have been deprived of three of their best players at this tournament. Um, they've yeah, yeah the, the like the fact the fact we're we've I feel like some of us have almost forgotten about that because of how because we've been focusing on the, the players who have been there and because England keep winning. But I think I think that these players will get back in, and I think it will only make England more competitive going forward. But for the moment, they can they can only think about the players who who they have in their squad, and I think they're more than capable enough to 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 win a first ever World Cup um, in the women's game. I think it would be brilliant, and I think I think we can do it. I think we can too. I know you're uh, obviously you you're you're in the know um, on on some things because of your your position. Do you know, and I'm, I'm being very presumptuous here, if we win, do we know if there's going to be a parade? Are you, are you in that much of in the know? Uh, I, haven't been, I haven't been told about a parade, but I would bet my life savings on it. I can almost guarantee you now there will be a parade if England win the World Cup. I can almost guarantee it. I'm just wondering when it pencil, would be. Pencil the Monday in. Do you reckon say. it'll be on the Monday? Monday or Tuesday, Pen- pencil them both in. <laughs> I was just thinking how long it would take to get back from from Sydney um, and even then, where would it be? I mean, obviously last time it was the day after the, the European Championships final, it was in Trafalgar Square. I, mean, I can only assume that it would be once again in London, but they would have to tour the country. I can't believe I'm being this presumptuous saying it's going to happen. Um, I just want to be part of it. Should it happen? Um, but that, yeah. that you pay, we're penciling Monday or Tuesday, yeah. I would do. I would say there is a very high possibility of a of a parade. Look, if you don't do a parade when you've won the World Cup and England haven't won it, I accept that. But if you don't, if you don't do a parade when you've won the World Cup, when are you going to do a parade? We did one for the European Championships. Here's a another half step above that. So let, let's hope they let's hope they do it. Let's hope so. Well, we've still got that game to come against Spain. Uh, hopefully, we can we can chat after it over a, a glass of a glass of champagne. Hopefully, hopefully so. Yes, <laughs> Dom. Thank you very much for your time. As always, um, been a pleasure. Yeah, let's let's speak again after the final. Let's do that. Thank you very much again for having me. Cheers. Many thanks to Dom there for his time. Always a pleasure. As I say we will speak once again after the final win or lose don't forget you can follow him on social media at mr dom smith on twitter you can also find him on threads you will also find him on the back pages of the evening standard 
Uh, don't forget, you can also follow the show on social media. Just search Three Lions Podcast and follow from there. Drop me a line if you'd like to say hi too. So it all began with this group of players under Serena Weigman back in August 2020. She officially began work as a Lioness manager in September 2021. 37 games later, she has the European Championship under her belt and only tasted defeat once. And she has taken the team to the biggest match in the game. Come on, the Lionesses. Let's win this. I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>